Verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. That is Genesis 1 verse 1. In the day that the Lord God made. That is verses 2 to 31 of Genesis. Earth and heaven. Notice the difference there again between created and made. Now I just want to say one thing before we go on to uh, the rest of this chapter. The six days of work are also a picture of the 6,000 years of man's history from the time that Adam was created. Now we are running to the end of this 6,000 period of man's history. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, it says in Second Peter 3. So we can say that in God's eyes, six days are now running out. And the seventh day is coming. The seventh day will be the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. When there will be perfect rest and peace. No war, no poisonous snakes, no wild animals. That will be the seventh day. It's all pictured there. The whole history of man, as it were. Is pictured there in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Now we can go on. In verse 5. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth. And no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth. Now here it is describing in detail. What God did on the sixth day. He first gives you an outline of what God did in seven days. And then. The writer gives a greater detail of how, what happened on the sixth day when man was created. He says there was no man to cultivate the ground. This was by the end of the evening of the sixth day and the morning had not yet come. The second part of the sixth day had not come. No man had been created yet. Everything else was finished. And there was no rain. But it says a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Maybe something like dew would fall upon the ground and water it. And it's possible, though we can't be certain about it, that there was no rain on the earth perhaps until the time of Noah. Because that's the first time we read that rain came upon the earth. And this is probably another reason why when Noah said that it's going to rain, nobody believed him. Because they said, rain, are you crazy? Man has been living for 2,000 years nearly and there's been no rain. You're talking about rain. That's what they told Noah. Rain. 2,000 years we've been going, you've been, now you're talking about rain. That's exactly what people say today. 2,000 years the church has been talking about the coming of Christ. Nothing's happened. And one day suddenly the rain came. And one day suddenly God's judgment will also come. But it says here, the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth. Verse 5. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. And he didn't pick up gold. He picked up ordinary dust. And it's just something interesting which I want to point out to you. That the Hebrew word which is translated here as dust. Is also translated in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 2 as dusty rubble or rubbish. And again in Nehemiah 4, verse 10, as rubbish. When they were building the wall, the people in Judah said, there is much rubbish here. And it's exactly the same word which is used in the Hebrew. It says there in the margin of Nehemiah 4, 10, or dust. It, we can say that God made man out of rubbish. So that we have a proper evaluation of all of this body of ours. And then you see the folly of man putting a garland of gold around this garbage bin. Have you seen people putting gold around the garbage bin? Decorating the garbage bin in their house with gold and lipstick. Painting all the... No, we were not created for things like this. 
God, the reason why God made man out of dust, out of that which is the most worthless thing on earth, dust. Who will pay money for dust? Is so that we realize that we are earthen vessels, but it is the one living inside. It is the transformation of the person inside which God is after. Otherwise our body is made of the same dust as the animals. You ask uh, the doctors, they'll tell you that. The functioning of the human body is exactly the same as functioning of all the animals' bodies. Same thing. The same dust. God made man out of dust. And we read here, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That is what made man different from the animals. He made animals from the dust. But here God formed the man. He took a personal interest. Which means he was interested in this body of man. It's not that this body is unimportant. What I'm saying is, we must remember that this body is made out of worthless dust. But God formed it. Jesus said in Hebrews chapter 10, A body hast thou prepared for me. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, in this body. That's why God formed a body for Adam. And we can say God has formed a body for you and me. The question is what you have done with that body in all the years that we have lived. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. We can say that God breathed into him a spirit. And what do we have there in verse 7 then? A body. God breathed the spirit into him. And man became a living soul. And so we see there, man is a trinity. Body, soul, and spirit. That's why God said, let us make man in our image. The angels are not trinities. The angels are only spirits. But man was made in God's image. Man is a trinity. Body, soul, and spirit. And we see that in verse 7. And what God breathed was the spirit. And it is in that spirit that we now have a conscience that tells us about God. And even unconverted people have that, that conscience that tells them about God. That's why even in the remotest jungles among barbarians, you'll find them, um, these people who have gone out and uh, discovered these lost tribes and people, They've discovered they are religious. They worship a stone or the sun or some tree or something. They are religious. But nobody's ever found a religious monkey or a dog so far anywhere in the world. Because this uh, spirit is not there. It's a spirit that makes man aware that there is a God. And God breathed into him. We are reminded of how... You see, there's a lot of similarity between this old creation and the new creation. Just like the old creation was completed, the God breathed into Adam in the beginning of the new creation we read on the first day of the week Jesus came into the midst of his disciples and he breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit John 20 verse 22 way back there God gave Adam a human spirit that was the old creation now in the new creation Jesus came and gave his disciples the Holy Spirit. And, verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. It's God who made a home for man. It's very encouraging for us to remember that. Man didn't go to God and say, Lord, I need a place to live in. God was concerned Man needs a place to live in. And he gave him a home. And that home was not a palace. It was a garden. Some people think only a palace would, would be the best place to live in. God gave Adam something far better than a palace. He gave him a garden. He planted a garden, he made that home and gave it to Adam. Do you believe that God loves you as much as he loved Adam? Is he interested in providing a home for us? According to your faith, 
be it unto you. God saw the need of a home for Adam, a place to live. Great encouragement for us. We can go to God in faith and say, Lord, you're the one who saw Adam's need for a place to live in. You see my need too? He certainly does. If you have faith, God's never disappointed a man who has had faith in him. The reason many people do not receive is because they do not believe. They insult God by thinking that God's not bothered about their accommodation problem, God's not bothered about any of their difficulties. Therefore, they live and die like miserable animals when they could have lived as glorious sons and daughters of God if they only had faith. God who saw Adam's need sees my need. Secondly, we read here in verse 9, Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. I want to tell you that there is an attractiveness that God has placed in creation and a sense of beauty that God has placed in us because that's part of his image. Don't think that beauty and attractiveness is evil. God didn't make all of this earth in black and white. White sky and black grass and black trees. He could have made it all like a black and white picture. He didn't do it. You look at the colors in the sunset or the colors in a flower garden and you can't imitate it. Look at the beauty there is in creation and that is in a fallen world. Think how it must have been before man fell. I just mention this because I see some believers who think that spirituality is to be sloppy, to be badly dressed, is spirituality. That's not true. You're not divine when you're like that. No, there's a beauty in creation and God expects his children to be neat and tidy, I'll tell you that. There's neatness and tidiness, which is part of God's nature. And that's something we've got to really acquire more and more. Pleasant to the sight. God knew that black and white won't be pleasant to the sight, so he made so many colors, so that it'd be beautiful for man to look at. For whom was it? Who was the one whose sight God was interested in? He wasn't bothered about the lions and the dogs looking at all these colors. I don't think they're bothered about the colors. He, he, he wasn't worried about the angels. They don't have eyes. They're, they're only spirits. He wasn't thinking about himself, he was thinking of man. When he put that sunset there, he thought of Adam and said, Adam will love to see that. When he put all these colors in the flowers, he said, Adam will love to see that. He thought of Adam. He thought of Adam just like a father, planning for his son. Think of that. And remember the word of God is true in Zephaniah 3.17. He is silently planning for you in love. He is. He silently planned for Adam in love, a home beauty in creation and good for food. That's another thing. You know these taste buds that we have, uh, God made them, the devil didn't make them. And there's nothing sinful about enjoying a good meal. There's nothing sinful about enjoying tasty food. God made those taste buds, provided I'm not a slave to them. There's nothing sinful about enjoying it. He made things that are pleasant to the sight and good for food. The only thing is man's abused all this. That's another thing. But it is God who made all these things pleasing to the sight and good for food. There's an attractiveness in creation. And the tree of life also. Good for food. I just want to mention something here else here. God who provided a place for Adam to dwell in also provided him food to eat. God knew that man needs food to eat. He's interested in that also. So we see a second thing that God provided for Adam. He provided him a place to live in, a dwelling place. And secondly, he provided him food and good food and food that was attractive. See that? See the goodness of God there? That God's interested in our food. Give us this day our daily bread. That's what Jesus taught us to pray. 
God's interested in it. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. And that was water for man to drink. And to water the garden. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. And I've thought of that verse. And I thought gold's good in heaven. But here on earth it's a snare. When we get up to Eden, we can say that again. The gold of that land is good. Now on earth, people fight for it and it's evil. The bdellium and the onyx stone are there. Precious stones. God made them all. And the name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Which perhaps gives us an impression, uh, an indication rather, so the Garden of Eden must have been somewhere in that region, which is now known as Iraq, somewhere there. It was on this earth, and the location is identified by these rivers, and that place, that's the place out of which later on, uh, where Babylon was built, the Tower of Babel was built there, Ur of the Chaldees is in that area, from which Abraham came out. And then we see something more. And the, uh, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Here's the third thing that God gave man. What have we seen so far? God gave him a home, a house, a place to live in, I mean. God gave him food. And God gave him a job. It's God who gives people jobs. See, these are the things people are occupied with on the earth. And all these things are here. God providing them all for Adam. A place to live in, food to eat, and a work to do. And it wasn't to sit and read the Bible. It was a very ordinary, down-to-earth work called gardening. Before sin came into the world, God was trying to teach man the sacredness of earthly work. Don't think that's something, oh, that's earthly work. I must sit and read the Bible and pray. Yeah, there's time for that. But God gave Adam a work to do, even before sin came into the world. Never forget that. The only thing that happened after sin came was that God told Adam, now you're going to perspire like anything when you do this work. Before that, he didn't perspire. Now he perspires when he works. But he still had work to do even before God gave him a job, a specific job. And said, your job is the gardener of Eden. And you must cultivate it. You can't just lie down lazily there and say, this is paradise, everything will grow by itself. No, he was given a job to cultivate it. And it says here, a second thing, to keep it. And the word there in the Hebrew is to guard it. To keep it means to protect it. And in that word, you get the impression that there is an enemy here who wants to spoil this garden. Otherwise, why should you use the word guard it? You don't guard something unless there are enemies or decoys around. And that word keep means to guard. He gave Adam a twofold job. Cultivate it and guard it. That's your job. You're the gardener and you're the watchman. So we can say that God gave a twofold job to Adam to be a gardener and a watchman. You don't think of those jobs as very big jobs these days. I think of the type of job God chooses for his children. Gardeners and watchmen. Simple, ordinary job. And that's what we see there in verse um, 15. 